Today, on only our second show of FT Monthly, I seek to get canceled by the left and the right as I cover recent Supreme Court decisions on affirmative action and religious liberty. I also look at the Duggar documentary, Shiny Happy People, and tell conservatives and myself that there might be some things to learn from this and some caution to be had. That and much, much more today on FT Monthly. Yes, we are a bit early this month, and part of the reason for that is because I am going to be heading out with my family. I'm going to be taking a short vacation the end of July here, and so maybe this is just a bonus June episode or whatever it is for you. I don't know, but we will see you in August after that, but it is a little bit early here. We'll be talking about a a few things that happened in June uh, and some other things as well. Hope your fourth was great. Mine was great. I did get hit in the leg with... A, an artillery shell bounced off and exploded about three feet away from me, but everything else was fine. We were all safe and it was great. It was a fun time with my family as well, but you're not here for that. You are here for our top three. So let's get into it. All right. Our top three today starts with a, an email I got recently from our freethinkingministries.com contact us page. If you want to talk about anything, Uh, You can drop us a comment below, or you can go to freethinkingministries.com, click on the Contact Us page, and talk about what you would like to consider, or you could uh, give us a question that you'd like us to answer. Uh, We may or may not get to it, but would love to hear from you. Uh, The first one comes from uh, somebody that has long looked at at our YouTube channel and our at our Free Thinking Ministries page, just wanting some resources on something she's having trouble with her son, who says See, there's probably a God, but that is probably not the Christian God, because a good God would not say something like, obey me or be sent to hell for eternity. So the question is, is Christianity evil? That's the big question that we're going to be asking today in topic number one. Now, I want to cover this topic in a few different ways, and I did respond to the email as well, but I wanted to talk about it here because I do think this is a legitimate question that some people ask. Uh, If God is a good God, then why send people to hell? But But I think what they're really asking is if God loves people, why, just because we make a mistake or two, should we be sent to hell for all of eternity? And I want to get into that a little bit. There's a lot of theological stuff behind this, but but hopefully some of this is going to be pretty practical. One of the things I want to say is that we're not establishing theism here. If you think there probably is a God, we're going to say that you think theism is probably true. So this is not an apologetic for theism, but this is an apologetic for Christian theism. So why does the Christian God make the most sense? Interestingly enough, uh, his objection to if a good God says, hey, obey me or go to hell, that actually sounds more like the the God of Islam than the God of Christianity. And we'll get into that in just a little bit. So if God is good, why would he send people to hell? One of the questions I would ask is, if God is God and if God is the creator, then when God creates, can he have expectations for his creation? Should his creation look a certain way? And for those of us who believe in libertarian free will, we believe that God, being a loving God, would only create a creation where people could freely choose to respond to that love by loving him back. So there needs to be an opportunity to say, nah, I'm good. I don't love you back. And if that's the case, does God have the right to withhold himself from people who say, no, I don't want to do that. So I'm going to look at Romans a little bit today, just just some splash it out there, say, hey, there's some things to consider here when we talk about that. But one of the questions that I would ask is, if God is a good God, and if he's creator, can he have expectations for creation? And I think the answer is a resounding yes. And, And I'm going to prove it by giving a finite example of parents who have children and are supposed to be taking care of their children. Can you have expectations for your children and how they behave and act in your house? Or if they just want to live how they want to live, are you just supposed to let them do whatever they want? Now, some people might say, yeah, you need to let kids do whatever they want, explore, find themselves. But that's not what parenting is. Parenting is about guidance. It's about allowing kids 
to explore with certain boundaries so that they can be safe, so they can learn, so they can grow, so that they can know the truth. And we go through this all the time, especially with my 12-year-old. Sometimes it'll be like, well, my friends, they all blank, right? And so my response is, I am not their parent. I am your parent. I know what's best for you. And we have these rules or we have these boundaries in place so that you can live a life that is fulfilling, so that you can live a life where you're able to do the things that you need to do because we know you best. Now, who knows creation best? but the one who created it. So God knows what to expect from creation, right? So should God have standards of behavior? I think the answer is a resounding yes. So should a loving God enforce those standards top down to say, you will do this no matter what? And some people say, no, that doesn't sound very loving. And I would agree, that doesn't sound very loving. But here's the, here, here's the rub. If they choose not to respond in love, does he have the obligation to force them to reside with him? That doesn't sound very loving either. So this is where Romans 1 comes in. So if you look at Romans chapter 1, you'll find that they exchange the truth of God for a lie. And when they exchange the truth of God for the lie, he gives them over to the desires of their hearts. They don't desire God anymore. They desire what they want. And because of that, they fall from that lofty, uh, that lofty position of representing God to creation. And they can no longer reside with God. That's why God kicks Adam and Eve out of the garden, for example. No longer can they be with him. Now, God extends a lot of grace because he could just annihilate them once and for all. But Romans chapter 1 helps us to understand what's going on here. The Christian world is, the Christian God is not one that says, obey me or else. It says, if you choose me, I will love you. If you don't choose me, I will let you live apart from me. And if James 1, 17 is true, and that anything and everything that is good comes from God, when we choose to live apart from God, then we choose to live apart from anything good. And if we choose to live apart from anything good, that means we are going to be in torment because there's nothing good that is around us. And so this leads us to, to the next objection. It might be something like, well, why do I have to pay for Adam and, and Eve's sin? I get that they were given these parameters. They knew God face to face and they rejected him. And I get that. But why do I have to pay for that? There's a few answers to that. There's a lot of answers to that. Theologically speaking, we get an original sin, total depravity, things like that. But I want to get into some very practical ways of thinking about this in a logical format. So this is where Roman, Romans 5 comes in. Death and sin enters through one man. Well, what does that mean? Well, basically what it means is this. Adam and Eve choose to rebel against God, and God created them. And so God says, fine, you want to be apart from me? You think you know what's right and wrong. I will let you be apart from me. But there are consequences that come from that. And they, and they accept those consequences. And you might say, well, I couldn't stop there. There are a few reasons. One is... Adam is so affected by sin that any parenting that he would do, whether or not you believe in uh, that the, the sin being passed on from generation to generation, any parenting that he and Eve could do is, is automatically imperfect. They are going to train their kids to sin. So no matter what, the next generation is trained to sin, next generation is trained to sin. No matter what, there is not an opportunity to for perfection. And God is a loving God, so he's not going to remove the children away from the parents. And so now we've got an issue where the parents are bringing up the kids who are only going to be trained to sin. The other option is uh, federal headship, that because sin enters through Adam, it is necessarily passed down through generations so that God can redeem all of mankind through one man as well in Jesus Christ. This is a Romans chapter 5 issue. In order to save all of humanity through one man, God must penalize the federal head of all humanity for his sin. Okay? Adam and Eve have been fallen because of the rebellion, and their offspring do not have the chance to grow up under perfection. All right. So if that's the case, then what is the gospel about? 
Well, the gospel is not about obey all of this list of things and then you will get eternal life. It's not about that. In fact, the Old Testament shows, and Romans again, all Romans 1 through 9 is all about this. The Old Testament shows that the law and the things that, that reveal the character and the perfection of God, all of those things, that law, it doesn't have the power to save. It only has the power to expose our sin and need of a Savior. And so the Christian religion, the Christian God, it's not about what we can do for him, but it's about what he did for us because we have been born in this state. And one of the things I would say is, do you agree that the world around us is messed up and that people sin and you sin and I sin? We do wrong things all of the time. And if God is a perfect God and can't reside or stand sin, where are we supposed to go? Is he supposed to just excuse that? But he can't because of his nature. In fact, he says to Moses, I can just pass before you, but a mere man looking at me would die, so I'll let you see just a part of my glory. So therein lies the rub for the everyday human being. It's not about doing these lists of do's and don'ts that get us access into heaven. It's about the fact that we need a perfect sacrifice because death is required payment for sin, and we need a perfect sacrifice, and that came in Jesus. In fact, God died for you and for me, fully God, fully man. Jesus Christ died for you and for me, and then defeated death by God raising Jesus from the dead on the third day. And because of that grace, we now have access to eternal life. John 3, 16, 17 is a great example of this. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, whoever believes in him would not perish but have eternal life. For the son did not come to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. For those who do not believe stand condemned already. Already condemned. Okay, so it's not, I did this list of sins and now I got to live apart from God. Number three, to understand hell as a place of torture and torment, like a, like a sadistic sort of thing, is a fundamental misunderstanding of what hell, the doctrine of hell is. And I wrote an article about this a few years ago. I'm going to post it in the description below. But it's a fundamental, disunder, fundamental misunderstanding of the theology of hell. Uh, the theology of hell stems again from James 1.17, that we have rejected the good, and now we live apart from the good. Now, annihilation could play annihilationism could play a role in that as well. Uh, I don't believe in annihilationism, but if you take a look at um, at my article that I list below, you could see some some examples of that. No one is being actively tortured by demons for eternity. Satan is not the king of hell. That is also a place for him to reside because he is going to have to live. For eternity apart from the good as well. So torment is more of a passive experience than an active, an active action taken upon a soul. The passive experience is now I am apart from the good. I've gotten what I've wanted. I've rejected God. I've said, I want to live my way. I don't believe in Jesus. I'm going to live the way I want to. And I've gotten what I want. And I'm going to live apart from the good. But that means all of good. And one of the fundamental misunderstandings that we have is that, well, it's just going to be kind of like a big party because it's all sin. But the thing about sin is all of sin is a bastardization of the good. What do I mean, what do I mean by that? It's a, it's a perversion of the good. So sexual sin. Sex is good, but sexual sin is a perversion of the good. So all you will get if you get anything, would be perversions of good that actually hold you bondage. And this is what sin promises. Sin always promises freedom, but always delivers chains. That's it. Every sin. You lie, you think you're going to get away with it, you think you have freedom, but now you've always got to build on that lie to maintain the, the, fictional, uh, the fictional thing that you've, you've created for yourself. Sex, you, you you think that sex is going to give you freedom, but really it ends up giving you bondage. Maybe there's sickness that comes with it. Maybe you just feel lonely, or maybe uh, you just you can't find that connection. And it just 
it, it gives you bondage and you can't get out of it. Addiction, the same way. It, it promises freedom. It delivers bondage. So everything you experience apart from God for eternity would look like freedom, but would just be bondage all of the time, every time, every single thing, everything that you would do. I don't know what all of that looks like, but the idea is that you're apart from the good for eternity. So you are tormented because you have no good things. And the rich, rich man and Lazarus is a good example. Not even water to quench the thirst, because that is a good thing. The chasm is too great. You can't pass through it. So the choice is not obey or be tortured. God is not a sadist. The choice is believe and be with the good, or refuse to believe and reside with the opposite. And the choice is yours. You can believe in Jesus Christ. That's all it takes. Place your faith in Jesus Christ. Recognize yourself as a sinner. Recognize that Adam sinned and now you sin and you need a Savior. And if you do that, it's not about what you can do for God. He's already done all of the work. Now, one last caveat is that does not mean then, again, in Romans, that there's a license for sin to say, now I can do what I want because grace may increase. May it never be, the Apostle Paul says. Well, why does he say that? Because Jesus says, I came that you may have life and have it to the full. And what he means by that is not, I came to be a killjoy, but I know what you were created for. I know what you were designed for, and I can help you come to that full realization if you trust in me. You will be fulfilled. It's about fulfillment. And that fulfillment is going to be the greatest sense of gratitude and the greatest sense of accomplishment that you will ever have that fulfillment in Jesus Christ to say, this is what you were created for. So do that. And that's what we call sanctification, continuously working to make us more like Jesus, more like what we were created to be in the first place before sin messed it up. And that's why those who believe in abiding sin or, or claiming that things that clearly are sin aren't sin miss the whole point, because now they're exchanging one form of fulfillment for another form of fulfillment that is not going to be lasting, and it is only going to lead to despair. All right. So number two, we're going to get to the Supreme Court and Scripture. This is going to be an exciting one, because the Supreme Court, apparently some people don't pay attention to it. That's what my wife tells me, which is fine. We're going to pay attention to it for you. I'm not going to get into all of the politics of it. I'm going to explain, explain a little bit and then get into some scripture of it, because I think that's important. Um, there's a lot of conservative takes about what these decisions are, um, and I think I think it is important to look at, well, how should we think about it as Christians as well, as, as Christians involved in society and in politics? Now, two decisions came down that are, uh, that are making headlines. One is the basic dismissal of affirmative action as a policy in college admissions. We'll get to that in a little bit. Another one is religious liberty and being able to not participate in certain activities because uh, of your religious bent as a business. So first, affirmative action. Well, what is it? Well, affirmative action uh, was put in place after the civil rights movement for disaffected uh, young African-American people to be able to get into prestigious uh, universities uh, at easy, in, in a more easy way, uh, in an easier way, uh, basically lowering some of the standards so that they could get in because they have been disadvantaged uh, throughout Jim Crow and, and the segregation of the South. Uh, now, I'm not going to argue whether or not affirmative action, as it was originally intended, would have should have been a good thing or not, but I am going to say that there are two people that have pointed out the flaws of affirmative action that they have actually not benefited the African-American community in particular. One guy's name is Thomas Sowell. He says that most affirmative action cases uh, get into these schools, but will end up dropping out at higher rates where they could have gotten into a good school, maybe not Yale, but Northwestern, heck, UNL, um, UNO, whatever, that's that's in Nebraska, could have gotten into them and had a successful degree, but instead they got admitted to a school with higher standards and they end up dropping out and they don't end up going back to school. If affirmative action hadn't been in place, they would get rejected from that school and go to a good school where they can make a good living and still learn and maybe not fail out. That's Thomas Sowell's point. Uh, Justice Clarence Thomas, who is one of the justices on the Supreme Court, 
He said that in his life, it was difficult for him to find a job because people assumed that he wasn't competent because they assumed he he's a he's an African-American justice. They assumed that he was an affirmative action uh, admittance into a school, which he which he was not uh, and that he was not smart enough to to get where he needed to be. So it's hard to, for him to find a job. Those those are the hidden stories behind affirmative action. But really what striking down affirmative action says is that the Equal Protections Clause says, uh, hey, uh, you can't discriminate based on race for admissions. You can take a lot of factors into consideration, but you can't discriminate based on race. Why do I think that this is a good thing? And I do think that this is a good thing. It's not because I don't love African-American people, African-American youth. I don't want them to get good education. That's not why. I want them to. But I think affirmative action had a soft bigotry of low expectations. I believe in their ability to make those test scores. I do. And and I believe in the ability to, to enrich schools in a way that they can actually, <clears throat> that they can actually experience better education. I totally, totally think that that's the case. But here's the thing. The soft bigotry of low expectations says because of your race, you won't be able to. And I disagree with that. That doesn't mean you couldn't take into account somebody who came from a poor urban neighborhood, did the best that they could, is a hard worker and a great learner. In fact, in the in the decision, uh, Clarence Thomas basically says that you can take all of those factors into consideration, but the deciding factor can't be skin color. And I think that's a good thing. And I think that's a good thing because I think it actually reflects biblical values. I do. And let me show you what I mean. Proverbs 20, 23 says this, differing weights are an abomination to the Lord and a false scale is not good. Proverbs 20, 23. And, and I think that this is what's going on here. There's differing weights based on skin color alone. It doesn't mean you can't take into factor a lot of different things and say, okay, based on the things that I know, you could probably succeed here. I'm going to admit you. But to say, well, I'm going to favor you only because of your skin color is a differing weight. It's a false scale that tips the scales in an unjust manner. And I think that overturning affirmative action actually leaves things more biblically. As far as college admissions goes, there's a lot of other issues in colleges that I don't have time to address right now either. The other Supreme Court decision that uh, we are going to talk about today is the Supreme Court decision of this Christian web designer that decided not to make a web page celebrating a homosexual met, homosexual wedding. Uh, it, it's an interesting story because apparently the guy in the case says he never even asked her. So it's, the question is, why did this even make it all the way up to the Supreme Court? So the Supreme Court said she had the right to refuse the service. Now, if you look at people on the right, um, they'll say, hey, it's a victory for religious liberty. If you look at people on the left, uh, just the headlines alone, you can just see where their bent is. It's like, oh, this is a, this is a blow to uh, LGBTQ rights. So what's going on here, really? I think what's going on here is, and, and I'm not entirely interested in the decision in and of itself. Um, I do think it's the right decision uh, because I think you should be able to have the right to not participate in what you think is an act of worship that someone's asking you to participate in, even if they're going to pay you. And that's that's what this woman was doing. She was not saying, hey, if you're gay, I won't serve you at all. I won't build any sort of website. She was saying a particular website, a website focused on a homosexual wedding, which I don't believe is legitimate, I can't do. And first of all, I applaud her for taking the stand. It's difficult to take that stand. Second of all, I think this also runs in line with the article I wrote uh, about, about Target and the biblical boycott and not participating in the new religion. And what she's saying here is this new religion of identity and this new religion of, of homosexual identity and sexuality, I am not going to participate in that. And you can take me to the Supreme Court, but I refuse to say yes. And she's putting her business on the line because she's refusing to be a part of the sacrifice. And this is another just Ephesians 5 delineation have nothing to do with the deeds of darkness means don't participate in the sacrifice. That doesn't mean don't relate to people that don't that believe differently than you. It doesn't mean that. 
And I think she made the right decision. I think the Supreme Court made the right decision as well. All right, before we get to number three, I want you to like and subscribe and share this video with your friends and your family and maybe even some enemies if you would like. We get to get going to get to our third one. And our third one is an exciting one for me because uh, these two men I respect greatly. Uh, and I really enjoy watching Sean McDowell's YouTube channel. If you don't watch his YouTube channel, you should. And he had a guy named Frank Turek on recently to discuss his uh, his book. I want to make sure I get it right here. Uh, correct and not politically correct. We'll put a link to that book in the description. Uh, and it includes a discussion on transgender ideology. I've done a lot of writing and speaking on transgender ideology. So Turek and McDowell get together to discuss this book. And at the outset, I want to say I don't know either of them personally. I've had a very brief interaction with Sean once, and uh, Frank Turek's website sometimes runs some of, some of my articles. But I've never had a personal conversation with either person. I will say that one of the things I love about both of them is they're gracious, but they stand for truth, and I respect them greatly. So as I address this video, it's an hour-long interview. We're not going to look at the whole thing because I'm not going to keep you here for days. Uh, but we're going to look at just about a three-minute clip. And when we look at this clip, I think it's important for us um, to, I think it's important for us to recognize that as I look at this clip, uh, I am not disagreeing with what they're saying, but I think there's a little bit of something missing from what they're saying. And I want to add a little bit of context of my own. And hopefully they're okay with this. I'm going to click, I'm going to put a link to the whole video in the description below as well. But in this conversation, in this part of the conversation, they're talking about uh, the risks of transition surgeries, both medically and mental and mental health wise. Um, and Sean brings up the question that he's going to bring up here and hopefully have it uh, queued up right. I'm going to share it. And as I share it, I'm also going to play this in two times speed so we can get through it pretty quickly and uh, make sure it's two times speed. Um, so as I share this, let's just take a listen and hopefully it's in the right spot. And as we take a listen, uh, I'm going to I'm going to talk about two things that I feel like are maybe missing a little bit from Frank's answer. Not that he doesn't believe them, but they might be missing. Suicide rate goes through the roof because what was promised to them mm. isn't fulfilled. You cannot change your sex. It's impossible biologically. And yet they've been told they can. Hmm. We're going to come to that question of increasing the suicide risk in a minute. But I have a number of people who watch this who are would be Christians who describe themselves as affirming, non-Christians who are in the LGBTQ community, super honored that they watch this. And I know right now they're going to be thinking, at least some of them might be thinking, Frank, that is an exception. And that's unfortunate. But in every kind of surgery that we have, some just go bad. This is hmm. the nature of it. But most people who have the transition uh, describe the experience differently. So hmm. why pick on the exception and make it the norm? Uh, what would you say to that kind of response? Yeah, well, I would say tell me what the right protocol is for, same, for, for sex transition surgery. There isn't one. There's, 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 no way, there's no way to do it. It's, and, and this is what Scott Nugent and others have said, that there's really no way of doing this. They're making it up as they go because it's impossible. And look, you can always get a good result out of a bad process, right? There's no question about that. Sometimes things just work out for whatever reason. The question is, should this be policy moving forward that we encourage? And in our free society, we might say, okay, after someone is an adult, if they want to go through this, they, they're, they're free to do it. Uh, mm -hmm. But certainly this should never be, in my view, foisted on children, no matter what children say, because mm -hmm. children change. Uh, children go through phases. Children can't give their informed consent. In fact, there's a lady out there in California, her name is Chloe Cole. Uh, I talk about her in the book as well. Uh, she had her perfectly healthy breast removed when she was 15 years old. Now at this writing, she's 18, maybe she's 19 by now, and she's suing her doctors going, what do you do to me? And this is why, by the way, in the UK right now, which you know is more so-called progressive than we are, Sean, they're closing their gender clinics. Why? Because they started earlier than the United States. And the problem is, is that the people they operated on now are, many of them are horrified. When they were children, they were operated on, and other adults, and they're going, what did you do to me? Mm. And they are suing these clinics. That's why they're closing. Now I was going to ask you about Okay. So uh, I encourage you to watch the whole thing. Uh, but I, I wanted to talk quickly about uh, Frank's answer here because I you can't say everything all at once all the time, right? But I do want to talk about his answer here because I think it's important to note a few things. The first thing is that the 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 question that Sean brings up is a legitimate question, but the answer that Frank gives, while also a legitimate answer, I think is incomplete. It's not just what is the correct protocol. The, the question is, is relief of suffering the only end to any sort of surgery or any sort of thing that we would do for this sort of uh, difficult life situation. Uh, and I don't think that it is. I don't think relief of suffering is the only thing to consider. And I'll give, I'll give some examples. 
let's say uh, somebody uh, is older and they they have they 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 have dementia and they're they're still with it, but they're not all the way done yet. And they and they want to die before they lose all of their faculties. Is it ethical? Is it moral to assist them in their suicide? Now that could seem like a difficult issue. Canada says it is because they're following the same train of thought. Well, if I if it relieves suffering, then it's it's a net good. We should do it. But that's not the case. Killing somebody, maiming somebody, because they have a mental issue or 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 spiritual issue or or they're 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 depressed, saying, you know what, you should die or you should get this surgery is not the moral thing to do because life is precious and they're an innocent human life. And they shouldn't be maimed or they shouldn't be they shouldn't be killed because of it. Or for example, there's there's uh, something called um, body integrity dysmorphia, and body integrity dysmorphia says, "Well, I I think I should have been born with one arm." So if I go into the doctor and say I should have been born with one arm, and I say, "Could you please chop this off?" Because if you chop off this arm, I'm going to be relieved of my pain. I'm going to feel like my real self. Is it ethical for that doctor to say, "You know what? Since it will relieve you of your pain, yes, I will do it." I would argue, no, it's not, because the issue is not with the healthy arm. The issue is with something inside their soul, which is going to lead me to the next thing that I think is is missing a little bit uh, from this response. Again, not that Frank doesn't believe this, but that I kept waiting for this response. I didn't see it. The other thing that's missing, uh, which is just pro- probably not part of the conversation in general about the book, is the church's response to this, because this is being foisted on kids. This is being foisted on people who don't have all of their faculties together. Even adults who just think this will help, uh, we find that suicide rate does go up, um, even 10 years after the surgeries. Uh, but even if suicide rate didn't go up, that doesn't make the surgeries okay or good. It means uh, they have issues beyond what their physical uh, abilities can can manage. So what's the church's response? I think the church is not ready for what is happening in England to happen here because there's going to be a plentiful harvest of of people who have been disaffected, who have been disenfranchised, who have been lied to, who have had these horrific surgeries done on their bodies and who regret it and now have no place to call home. They can't call people in that community home because they won't have them. They can't call... um, conservatives home because they think they won't have them. And the question for the church is, will we have them? And I hope the answer is yes, but I I don't know if we're ready for that answer. If a person who used to be transgender went through surgeries, comes to our church and walks through our doors, can we offer them grace, truth, love, acceptance in the real sense, not in the affirmation sense, because they are already saying, "I, I know what did this doctor do to me? I, I feel I feel like a shell of myself. Can we respond with love, grace, truth, and hope with them? I, I hope we can, but I think we need to start preparing for that because I think it's going to happen. I think it is going to happen. All right, now on to our main thing. Our main thing today is shiny, happy people. I teased this last month, and so we get to it today. Shiny, happy people. Uh, one of the reasons I wanted to talk about this because it really gets into a little bit of my story. I'm not going to share a lot of my story here, but for the uninitiated, Shiny Happy People is a documentary about a family with the last name of Duggar, and they were on TLC. They had a show called 19 Kids and Counting, and the show featured around their families, their conservative values, and uh, was just this holistic show. But then things started unraveling for them, first because their oldest son, Josh, I know, unfortunate name to have in this scenario, uh, got exposed for having uh, molested his younger sisters. And then because uh, late in the 2020s, Josh ended up getting indicted for having illicit child videos on his uh, computer at work and is now serving a prison sentence for this. So they made a documentary about this family. And I knew about the Duggars. I watched the show occasionally. My wife was a little bit more interested in the show. We didn't watch it religiously or anything. Um, And I knew about the Bill Gothard movement. I knew about ATI. I knew about IBLP, the Institute for Basic Life Principles. Um, 
and I knew the 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 nature behind it uh, was not good. And I was actually in in the process of kind of like writing a book of my own research on it. And then this documentary came out and I was like, well, they beat me to it. Uh, but uh, one of the things I used to say is it's kind of, it kind of generated militant homeschoolers. So uh, homeschool people that would say, Hey, if you are sending your kids to public school, you're abusing them. Or uh, there's only one way to do this. We need to all huddle together and be the frozen chosen, that sort of thing. Um, and, and that, that stuff does exist. So I want, I want to say that stuff does exist. But the documentary kind of starts to conflate a few things and meshes some things together. I want to get through some things that that I think were important to discuss in the documentary. And then I'm going to give two takeaways uh, that I had that will hopefully inform you as you watch it. The documentary exposes a few new de details about the Duggars, but not a lot. And in my opinion, the Duggars were just kind of an excuse to make a documentary about Bill Gothard that people would watch because it's mostly about um, the Gothard movement. And, and the things that are going on there. There's a quote at the beginning episode, the first episode, that is important to carry through with you throughout all four episodes. And one of the interviewees that they have says, the IBLP teachings aren't Christianity. It's something entirely different. And I think that's absolutely right. I think they are something different. And that's important to carry with you because they're actually going to conflate conservative Christianity with this movement. Uh, and a few weeks ago, when I, when I released the first video, I said, hey, honest youth pastor, somebody who I, I don't know personally, but I enjoy his, his content, um, that he had a good breakdown of the show, and he does. So make sure I'll provide another link to that. Make sure you go check that out. Um, but I wanted to provide a little bit of context as well. Uh, so they're absolutely right that they're not Christianity. And you got to carry that with you because even as, as you get to the fourth episode, they interview this couple, these two YouTubers, and Honest Youth Pastor knows them, I don't, um, that are not part of the Gothard movement. But they seem to lump them in with it because she uses, the 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 woman uses the word submission to her husband in it, and they they lump that in with submission uh, and in the patriarchal sense. And I think it's important to recognize that the main tenet of Bill Gothard's teachings that they talk about is this umbrella of authority model. I'm going to pop up an image here for you. And you can see this umbrella of authority. At first blush, it kind of looks, you know, to the complementarian eye, it kind of looks like, yeah, that's right. But there's a few things wrong with this image. First, notice there are no words under what Christ provides. Okay. Um, that's important. There's no words under under what Christ provides. Uh, next, the hierarchy is is a little bit off, and there's nothing about love, uh, and there's nothing about uh, the only the only person that's supposed to love is the children in this in this scenario, uh, and that's an issue. That's an issue. So the main thing IBL teaches is the, is this umbrella of authority, and I call this family health and wealth. Family health and wealth gospel. Because what what Bill Gothard says is anybody who if you if you move outside of the umbrella of authority, it opens you to Satan's attacks. And so anything bad that happens to you must be because you're outside of the authority. Anything bad happens to children must be because you 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 were outside of the authority of. I mean, if anything happens to your to to the mom, it must be because some. It must be because you were outside of the authority of your husband. And this and this sort of health and wealth family gospel is not a biblical gospel. Jesus says that you, in order to follow him, you need to hate your father and mother, even your own life. And what he means by that is you need to love me more. So, so the children's goal is love parents and obey parents. I'll say not if not if the parents are asking you to do something that's not biblical. Not if not if the the husband is asking the wife to do something unbiblical, which also includes unwanted sexual advances, by the way. So your, your first allegiance is to Jesus. It's not to another human being. Um, and also Colossians 3.21 says, Fathers, do not provoke your children lest they become discouraged. Ephesians 6.4, Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. There's nothing about this in this model that even remotely handles these passages of, of, of Scripture well. 
And here's the thing about it. Uh, one of the quotes in, 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 the, in the video as well says, uh, every father is turned into a, a cult leader. It elevates men over women in, a health, in, an unhealthy, in an unhealthy way. It elevates men in general in an unhealthy way. And because of that, a lot of bad things can happen. I experienced similar things in ministry as well. I heard people say things like, oh, you can only talk to family because, because we're the only ones that know what's going on. Or... Um, the husband's supposed to prepare a place for his wife because Jesus uh, went and prepared a place for us. And and because Jesus is, is over the husband, the husband is over the wife, then the woman needs to stay at home under her father's authority until the wedding day, which is, first of all, just bad exegesis of that passage, but also part and partial of that umbrella of authority concept uh, that we see there in a way that is unhealthy and unhelpful. It denigrates women in order to lift men up. It denigrates women in order to lift, in order to lift men up, and that is not, and that is not a good thing. That is not a good thing, at all. Now the problem is once you're in it, like like anything else, once you're in it, you can't see a way out of it. So I'll give, I'll give uh, Jim Bob Duggar and other people involved in it uh, grace in this way. They think they're doing the right thing. Uh, one of the most jaw dropping moments on the show to me is when they play a clip of Jim Bob. And uh, he's being interviewed after stuff about Josh came out about him um, molesting his sisters. And he, they ask him, well, what, 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 why didn't you, why did you only do this? And his response is interesting. He says, well, as we talked to other people, many others were going through similar situations. And that's shocking. Why, why is that shocking? Well, it's shocking because that's not normal. No, Jim Bob. If you are involved in a culture where young boys are continue are, are are also molesting their sisters or or families are going through that similar situation, something is off in the culture. It's it's not that it's normal. That's not normal. That's not a normal thing. That's not a good thing. And he knows it's not good. But he he seems to say, well, it seems like it's just something people go through. It's not something people go through. Not, not, not usually. It's not something we went through in my family. But it is something that, unfortunately, people who hold to this authoritarian patriarchal model often do go through. And I think it's important to recognize that. How was that not a huge red flag to say, whoa, maybe the system that we're teaching might be encouraging some of this? Now, it doesn't mean every person that goes through that is going to do that sort of thing, but it does mean that it opens the opportunity and the potential for that to happen. So as far as I know, none of the other boys in the family have done things like that. But I have heard many stories of families who have gone through similar situations because, because they held to this authoritarian uh, model of leadership in the family, this Bill Gothard type model. Um, so here's the thing. Lack of accountability for men is not a good thing. And that's what this way of thinking teaches. And so they expose that really well in the documentary. I think uh, that it's, it's, it's done well. And I think conservatives would do good to heed it and listen and, and watch and think, is this something that's going on? Uh, but I think it's also important to recognize that the showmakers definitely have an axe to grind specifically against Christian nationalism and against conservative politics. They get into this weird Roe v. Wade situation um, that just it seems kind of out there. It's like, well, what does this have to do with it? Uh, I'll get to that in a little bit. At one point, a former person in the, in the, in the Gothard realm says the goal is world domination. So lumping this, this way of thinking with the normal conservative Christian way of thinking and saying they're the same thing is, is not helpful. It's ideal, ideological. And here's the thing. To say that Christians wanting to impact culture to better represent their values, to say that that, that is a bad thing is, is ridiculous to me because everybody does that. Conservative Christians, fundamentalist Christians, um, everybody except for the Amish okay, are, are doing that. Progressive people want the culture to more uh, more reflect their values. And so they're going to be activists and they're going to do things to and vote in certain ways to get that accomplished. Conflating those two things to say, well, the I, IBLP wants to do this, so white nationalism, that sort of thing, um, is, is just fundamentally 
uh, flawed and I think something that they did on purpose to try to uh, move the needle. So it's important to note that. It's also important to note that they 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 seem to have a vendetta against homeschooling in the in the show as well. And I will say homeschooling is not the problem. Uh, plenty of people homeschool that don't hold to the IBLP ATI curriculum um, and and do it greatly. I know some homeschool families that are amazing, um, and that that I love very much that are nothing like that. And so that's not helpful at all either. And so, in fact, homeschooling is, is maybe even preferable with the way our culture is moving in a lot of ways. Even if you're not a Christian, it may be even preferable. So that was not helpful. So in the end, I found that this documentary was more about Bill Gothard than about the Duggars. And I think, I suppose that was probably a good thing. We didn't find a lot of new stuff out about the Duggars. We found out that uh, Jill and Jess, had ne- the kids never really got paid, which doesn't, doesn't surprise me given the authoritarian concepts of, of the Bill Gothard movement. We, we found out a, a few new things, but not much. It was all pretty much public information anyway, but we, we did find it, it was mainstreaming the insidious nature of the Bill Gothard kind of cult way of thinking about things. And I think that that was important. So there are two things that I think are important to carry with you. If you, if you watch this show, And maybe you won't watch it, which is fine. Uh, You can move on with life. Um, First is that secular society taking this series and claiming that it's about all conservative Christianity is just ridiculous. And you can push and we should push back against that and say, no, uh, we don't agree with this. Um, That's not the way we teach. It's not that's not that's not what we do. Um, and, And it helps to bifurcate that as well, which leads to the next thing. One of the things that I've seen we um we sometimes become mired in as conservative Christians is we defend and protect people like those involved in the Gothardite movement because we think they have the right politics, but they don't have the right Jesus. Jesus doesn't, I'll put this up again. The point of this image is not that Christ saves, it's that Christ gives authority to the husband. But Christ saves all of these people, okay? Christ saves all of these people. And in fact, says that the husband should love the wife as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. And so the husband is not just supposed to lord over his authority over his wife. In fact, Jesus says, you should not lord your authority over. If any authority you have should be used for service. And that's not teach taught in that. And so they might have they might be pro life i want everyone to vote pro life they they might they might have some conservative values but the other values they have are not healthy and so if though if 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 they are elevated i don't think that's good for our churches i don't think that's good for society in general and we should stop acting like it is all right and that's it uh, one last thing before we get going just a reminder we got the unapologetic conference coming up in september please sign up for that don't worry i'll be done plugging that soon don't know how many tickets are available left for that as well but go to texasapologetics.org to check that out thank you for joining me would love to hear your comments and thoughts on the show and very excited to be a part of this and moving forward until next time stay reasonable <laughs>